the violation of difference and the violation of the subjectivity of other is in it's not violating any laws of ours which i mean fundamentally it is but fundamentally it's a violation of the laws of the universe itself that violation of not recognizing the difference of other upholding it inside of the totality of the communion and and uh and in so many ways uh in so many ways we are experiencing as you so clearly point out in the post doom all of your post doom conversations what we're experiencing is the disappearance of the subject at all levels in all places whether it's the polar ice caps or our animal companions or uh black lives in the united states it's the or women even the disappearance of the subject and we are in direct violation of the laws of the universe so that's why this principle is so central and understanding it within the larger comprehensive context of the universe is is essential because it's not our man-made uh, human-made laws it's the laws of the universe that we're violating that's that's quite serious because i'm feeling the the call the uh, invitation to be clear for myself where is that point that can nourish me on a day-by-day -day basis that can nourish me in the inner way that can then support my outer work so right meditative movement mm -hmm. um that honors the the rhythms and flows of the energy yes and a very simple one is the the ocho or the figure eight to energetically just make this motion mm. to help balance mm. just even that in a moment of panic fear grief you know whatever that is uh, after watching the news balance self out you right. know after reading some of this stuff that we're doing because we're taking the world in uh, right. and we want to be able to go back out in service to that world and not get to pull down into the black hole of of all the difficulties Well, Gail, what a delight to see you and to be able to interact with you in this uh, totally new context uh, of not just living amidst contraction, societal contraction and, you know, collapse, but in a coronavirus era and how the universe story, how Thomas Berry's legacy and work continue to live in you. Um, so anyway, right, so I just want to welcome you to this uh, post-Doom conversation series. Thanks, Michael, and it's great to be here, and great to be here with all of you who are the listeners. Uh, I've been following the post-Doom conversations, and you've had many wonderful speakers and perspectives, so I'm just happy to be part of the, that whole contribution. For those who don't know you, who've never uh, read or listened or, or met you, uh, are not familiar maybe even with Thomas Berry's work um, or Green Mountain Monastery, help us understand who you are in the world, what you bring to the world, and what you're particularly concerned about or passionate about these days. To introduce myself and answer your question, um, maybe I, I will just start back in, um, in 1982, I uh, entered the Order of the Passionists congregation, which is a congregation of men and women in the Catholic Church, uh, priests and sisters. And, uh, and in that order was a, um, a, a priest named Thomas Berry, who was a cultural historian, and uh, he was a self-acclaimed geologian or a student of the earth, as you know, Michael. And um, Thomas Berry studied cultures and religious traditions from around the world. And when he exhausted that study, he went into the study of the universe story and the earth itself. And um, so be because we were in the same congregation, uh, during our studies, the uh, community brought in Thomas Berry to give us classes. And, it, and so in 1984, he came in and he oriented us to uh, our role in the universe story and uh, introduced us to our place in the, this larger cosmological context. So when I heard him speak, I, I knew oh, I'm going to follow this man. This is where my dedication is going to be for the rest of my life. So I asked him, could I study with you after this class? And he said, yes. So he, um, I, he lived in Riverdale, New York. So I would go there once a month and 
and Michael, I think you know this, but there was a famous diner called the Riverdale Diner where he would bring his students. And, and it, was, oh, it was always an amazing adventure because, you know, I would often think, wow, we're in this diner and over French toast and scrambled eggs, we're inside of the vast cosmological processes and context and trying to discover and understand our role in, the, in this vast time developmental universe. So, um, so from that, from 19, around 1982, began studying with Thomas. And in 1994, Thomas Berry wrote a paper which was entitled Women Catholic Sisters or Women Religious, the Voice of Earth. And as a cultural historian, he traced the work of Catholic uh, sisters over time because uh, sisters were often on the leading edge of of uh, cultural and societal uh, change, you know, through the creation of really big influence through healthcare, education, social work, and all that. And and historically, he said, which was true, that communities were established to meet the needs of the human community, and there'd never been a community of Catholic sisters founded specifically for the healing and protection of Earth and its life systems. So we said, we'll do that. You know, let's do that. Let's found this. So Thomas Ferry and myself and uh, Bernadette Bostwick co-founded the community that I am part of now called Sisters of the Earth Community. And, and the orientation of that community is within the cosmological context and understanding our role in our cosmological planetary moment. So that's yeah. just a brief summary. Yeah, that's fabulous, yeah. Gail. I'm, I'm so grateful in your introduction that you mentioned about Sisters of Earth and and really taking on as a religious responsibility, uh, a healing of our relationship to the planet. And um, I just wanna honor Sister Miriam McGillis as the first major mentor for me of somebody who was popularizing Thomas Berry's work in a supremely effective way. Um, I poured over for several years, I poured over her videos and audios, Lou Nisnik, of course, and recorded all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and when she said something particularly effective, as when Brian Swim did, I'd stop it. I'd say the same thing until I could say it, you know. And these were my mentors, my yeah. teachers, the people who helped me not only integrate it personally, but then be able to communicate to others the profound ecological and evolutionary wisdom of, of Thomas Berry's work. And so I do, I'm well aware, and I've said many times, that it's the Catholic nuns, largely in the 1980s, 1990s, and since, but so many of this, these ecologically earth honoring, earth celebrating Catholic nuns have really done more to further uh, Father Thomas's uh, message uh, than, yes. than anyone. Yeah, Michael, as you're mentioning Miriam McGillis, I'm, I'm thinking about the fate of the earth. Remember yes. that tape? And yeah. I, I just am remembering that quote. She, she quoted at the end, I, I don't know who it was. Ruben Alvarez. Yes. I remember at the, in the dark of the night, in the yes. dark of the snow, in the dead of winter, families dying, wars raging. I walk the rocky hillside sewing clover. Oh, right. That's how yeah, she that's... ended that tape. Yes, uh, yes. And yes. it was such a beautiful poetic uh, closure to a, uh, you know, a world, a world uh, in chaos, a world in darkness, and yet the, 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 uh, the capacity to sew clover, to keep on with a faithfulness to... Yes, uh, yes. She also, at the, toward the end of that tape, as I recall, she also quoted Ruben, Al, Ruben Alvarez um, on, you know, hope. I forget the exact quote, but I, I know I've got yeah. it on the website. And about yeah. a decade ago, Connie and I created a, um, a digital version of the Fate of the Earth, of her Fate of the Earth oh. tape, because that, of course, spread. I, I mean, I remember creating like 500 copies of Fate of the Earth tape and just giving them out to everybody. Yeah. So there's a digital copy of that. So uh, in the editing of this conversation, I'm sure Connie will uh, let folks know where they can find because I, I listened to it again a few years ago. And, you know, there were a few places. I mean, it was recorded in the 1980s, you know, mid 80s. And so, you know, there are a few, few places where she has the science wrong. Um, but my gosh, is it still deeply inspiring? Yes. Yes. Wow. Well, Mm -hmm. Gail, I want to ask you about the language that we've been using. I mean, I've been using this post-Doom conversation series, and, and as you mentioned, you've you know, watched or listened to a number of them, so you have a sense of how I'm using the term, but what language do you find useful, or what, what do you, how do you speak of our times? Well, um, yeah, well, it's been coming up for me over the past months, especially in this corona 
corona infected era is um, I would call it conversation. I call it conversations from inside the implosion. And um, yes, what's coming to me again and again is that the sense of uh, the supernova explosion that, that uh, I guess Brian Swim gave a name to the, our grandmother star calling it Tiamat, right? And uh, that explosion of supernova uh, was an implosion. It was the implosion of a star that then exploded out. Um, the elements of that star formed our solar system and our planet, and those are the elements of the periodic chart, uh, all those elements that were inside the, our grandmother's star. Mm -hmm. But the implosion process of that star took a very long time. Implosion isn't, wasn't just momentary or isn't momentary in a giant star, but the implosion process is a process of intense heat and intense contraction and the whereby the elements have to maintain their their individuality and their centers and they hold together while the totality of the inside space is in chaos and 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 it feels like this is this is a an implosion moment so i like conversations from inside the implosion I like and that. And then it's just this reflection on the universe as having both a violent and a creative momentum all through its, you know, 13.8 billion year unfolding. And so that violence and creativity or destruction and chaos are found throughout the entire cosmic process. And, and it, it feels uh, also um, what constitutes violence in the universe are you know, those three qualities of um, resistance, energy, and dreaming. And so, so why, why it feels like an implosion moment of violence and destruction to me, and where the conversations are that I hear inside of that metaphor. But it feels like it's like not just a metaphor, but it's an actual experience we are together as a Earth community and humanity inside of an implosion. But the resistance, uh, those three elements that constitute violence are resistance, energy, and dream. And the resistance is when we, ha when we have structures and we have achievements that we want to keep and not let go of. Mm. So there is an element of holding on to yes. certain things that need to be let go of. And the resistance comes when, when there is a refusal, you know, to, to an insistence on keeping what is. Yes. And then the energy in the cosmos, the energy has to be decided upon. We have to decide where the energy is going to go. Does it go to maintain what has been or does it go into new directions? And that brings the dream in. It's like it's the, uh, the future makes an energy bid. So where is the energy going to, you know, where are we like going to put the, the energy? An so, energy bid, yeah. yeah, so the future's bidding right now with, you know, Black Lives Matter, uh, with the uh, climate uh, crisis, you know, uh, with the way we're going to direct our lives through after Corona. So there is an energy bid uh, calling us from the future. And it's the decision of where we put that that's going to determine uh, new structures. Mm -hmm. So that goes all the way, so just to tie this up, it just goes back to conversations inside the implosion. Yeah, no, I like that. I've never heard anybody use that and it, it works a lot given my understanding of both the, the create, the, 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 the destructive process, there's a lot of, the, there's a lot uh, of creativity, especially in the implosion of a, of a supernova that creates the periodic table of elements that of course we don't exist without. So um, the, really the heart, of, uh, the heart of this series is inviting my guests to share their testimonial, their story, their trajectory, basically their pilgrimage. But how was it for you growing up in terms of your worldview? Um, and then how has that shifted over time to lead you to where you are now and, uh, and your own legacy work, your own life purpose, your own mission? Also any books or individuals or workshops along the way that were significant enhancements, significant challenges? Uh, how did your worldview, how mm -hmm. did you get to a post-doom place? How did you get to a place where you can celebrate conversations inside the implosion? And take as long as you want. Right. Well, yeah, what's coming to me in that question are two things. Uh, 
two significant moments and they have to do with the head. One has to do with the head or the intellect and the other has to do with the heart or the interior. So I think that the two of them have formed a integrated uh, base for the question you're asking for myself. And, and one is that um, it, one happened when I was six years old. So it's a very primal uh, experience of, of, uh, uh, of, um, of the interior. Yeah. So that, so what happened was um, I was six years old and I was growing up in Brooklyn, New York. And um, we would, it was a snowy day and we would, uh, we were making a fort outside with the snow and all the girls were in one fort and all the boys <laughs> were in another fort and we were making this snowy fort. And uh, so, you know, we would be protecting ourselves against the the boy team, you know, and then we'd be throwing snowballs at them and they'd be with and who's gonna withstand and whose fort is gonna stay, you know, solid through this, you know, <laughs> encounter. Anyway, um it was very cold and and I eventually we won by the way, the girls won. Our fort was stood stood, stood sturdy. And um I went back upstairs into to my my apartment, the apartment and my mother was there and she said, you know, wow, it's time for lunch, but look at your hands, they're frozen and you know, you gotta warm up. So here's some soup. So I had some soup and then she said, Now, you know, I was only six, now it's nap time, time to go to bed. Lay down for a little while, rest you know, rest your body and your hands, warm them up. So I was lying in bed and I was looking at my hands and I was say, asking the question, well, what does it mean to be me? What is this? Like, what, what am I? What, what does it mean to be alive? You know, like I was just with the hand, like, and I, I, um, I held the question by the neck and I really, I remember not letting it go. I was there for a long time going, what does it mean to be me? What is this? And then suddenly I had this experience of, of, a, of the tearing apart of the veil. Like suddenly I just had this profound experience of unity, of the, of the unity of, of the totality, the, the oneness of all of reality. And I, and I just knew it, simply knew it, you know, in my six-year-old body. Of course, I couldn't really explain it then, but I could explain it now. And it, as clear as day, I could still feel the reverberations of the unitive state, like the oneness of the, to just the oneness of the totality and, and all that goes with that, you know, the infinite field of vastness, the connection of love that links the whole thing and holds it all together coherence all of that so anyway so that was the deep interior experience and then uh and then years later meeting thomas berry and learning the story of the universe and uni meaning one one verse and the whole deep time structure of a cosmos that is one with itself you know at every level uh, it, 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 so the two of them form an integrative structure inside of my own psychic being. And it, so it wasn't an accident. I don't think that I, I joined the monastery because the monastery is the place where we, we hit into the, both the interior and then the, and then the, and the intellect, the study. So inner and outer. And so I come, so in any, I just find this in myself that in any exploration of what is happening or the universe story or who we are, my tendencies go both ways, always to the interior uh, and then back out again. Yes. So, um, yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, you were asking about who informed, so many, inf many informatants around the interior in the in the in the uh, Christian tradition, particularly the mystics, mm -hmm. the women mystics, Teresa of Avila, Hildegard of Bingen, Julian of Norwich, who was also a uh, part of the the time uh, era when uh, during the Black Death, mm -hmm. and one of her famous lines was from the interior, right? That came out was all all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And uh, so these people, Thomas Merton, uh, John of St. John of the Cross, so a whole body of those who explored, they were scientists of the spirit. So those scientists of the spirit have informed um, me, and then we have the scientists of the exterior, and uh, people like Brian Swim and 
um, Lynn Margolis, and you know, you mentioned her before in our private conversation, and the many who have explored Lauren Isley and uh, the deep time scientists, the quantum physicists. So they're not separate, they're just two different ways of accessing the same orientation uh, into reality. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, that's one of the things that I've felt. Why, one of the reasons why I felt such a, a resonance and a, a brother-sister relationship with you and collegial friendship for so long, because we share many of the same mentors, but also many of the same inspirations. I mean, the, the scientists, <clears throat> as you say, scientists of the spirit, that scientists who their study of science has led them into a deeper, more personal, intimate communion with reality. Uh, mm -hmm. So they've got that mystic, the, the science has led them in that direction. I, I call it the evidential reformation where evidence is seen as modern day scripture. Evidence reveals God, reality's uh, perspective on, on reality and that our science, our best science can lead us into, and in fact, if it doesn't lead us into a more intimate, uh, healthy, humble relationship to reality, then our science has gone astray. In mm -hmm. fact, our religion has allowed science to go astray because ultimately I think it's, when you look at the history of our species, it's the, it's the role of religion or the role of life ways to insist that the future is never compromised by the present. So that moral voice that speaks mm -hmm. uh, with a sense of accountability to the future, if it doesn't come from religion, it's not gonna come from anywhere else. So that, that, that the scientists whose science gives them or drives them into a more uh, intimate, personal, humble, uh, celebratory relationship with life in its fullness as divine is awesome. And then on the other side, as you mentioned, several of the, you know, a number of the mystics who are coming from the religious tradition and yet who have a deep honoring of all forms of mm -hmm. revelation, not just in ancient books and in, in old men, but mm. what's coming through the other species, what the, what the animals are telling us, what the trees are telling us, what the climate is telling us as authoritative and as, uh, as a way of bridging. I mean, uh, I see the evolutionary ecological role of religion, but also the religious necessity of science mm. uh, and that both are necessary like DNA. And, and that's been so central to Thomas Berry's work and, and others such as you and, and, Brian and Mary Evelyn and others who have, have furthered his legacy. Hmm, Anything yeah. else you want to say about your story, uh, about, uh, you know, you and Bernadette uh, the founding the Green Mountain Monastery? I mean, to say a little bit more about, uh, and also how has Thomas Berry's work, how is the universe story as our first and only globally produced evidence-based creation story, how has that enriched your religious or spiritual life? How has that nurtured your, your inner communion and your understanding of your faith tradition? Yes, there, there, that has sensitized, really has uh, sensitized us to not try to fit uh, the universe story into the faith tradition, but go the other way around, rather explode the tradition out into the story of the universe, because that's vaster. And that's inclusive of every faith tradition and non-faith traditions. And it's a much more inclusive uh, uh, opening up and perspective. With Bernadette and I, uh, and meeting Thomas Berry, we, uh, we had many, many trips to his place in Greensboro, North Carolina. And then one of the synchronicities that we, we like to smile about is that when we uh, purchased this land here, we were looking for a place to, to begin. And uh, we just called up a sort of ad in the paper. We didn't even know what town we were going to. So we contacted a realtor and ended up in this town. He showed us, he showed us, a place we didn't like it and he said well the town below has another place for sale come and see it so we went down and it turned out to be this place which is greensboro vermont so it, it's just as thomas said a touch of heaven yeah. you know just like a touch of you know lovely synchronicity in that regard and as bernadette and i set up the green mountain our green mountain monastery and community we really were always located within thomas berry's uh, principles of what he called the ecozoic era. Yeah. And as you know, Michael, he, he coined the word ecozoic, translated as eco or house, and zoa as life, 
as a house of life. And he contextualized Earth's biological and geological history over time. So the Paleozoic was early life, Mesozoic, middle life, and then the Cenozoic, the last 65 million years of unfolding, uh, was another life era in the history of Earth. So that we are ending and have ended the Cenozoic, and it's the period of time when we as humans came on the scene after Earth had established uh, enough for us to fulfill ourselves you know, in its, uh, through its uh, beauty, its life uh, capacities for us to exist here on many levels. And we have closed that period. And that was a period where Earth was on its own trajectory. It was unfolding since the Paleozoic through the Mesozoic and into the Cenozoic on its own. But when we hit the Ecozoic, uh, we are, we are co-partnering really. So as Thomas Berry said, uh, we cannot create a blade of grass but we will decide whether or not there will be a blade of grass. So he, he had this two-pronged vision of going forward into the ecozoic, where we go into the future with the natural world in mutually enhancing ways, or he, he called the other way the technozoic. Uh, not as, not in, in critique of technology, but more as, as a term to indicate a, um, a, uh, a different trajectory where we continue to exploit and diminish the natural community. So Bernadette and I established the, the, the community around the principles of the ecozoic era, and particularly around the first principle of, so I believe Thomas had 12 principles uh, for the ecozoic, but the first is a primary, and our whole, our whole mission is around the first principle, which is this, that earth is a communion of subjects, and not a collection of objects. And that's the first, and we could really, we could really un unfold that one too. But that, I just want to, for the listeners too, that to, so that you can hear this principle clearly, it's so directive uh, for our future. Um, it's very simple, but that was Thomas's strength. He could condense a lot of complexity into simple points that are memorable really that kind of live like mantras inside, as you know, Michael, right? Yes, uh, I'm so glad that you mentioned that as well as the ecozoic technozoic distinction. Um, I just worked on a program uh, that I just uploaded literally yesterday, which is sort of my main evening program that I'll be doing via Zoom uh, throughout 2020. And in there, I, I quote Thomas Berry exactly that, that the, the, the earth and ultimately the whole of reality is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. Um, and uh, he also says the environment, what we call the environment, is not our surroundings. It's our source, sustenance, and end. Mm. You know. I, but then just a week ago, I listened to um, a, an interview with uh, Daniel Wildcat, a Native American elder and, and author. And he, he had another way of coming at the same thing in a, just a really sort of memorable phrase. He said, we walk, he, we walk among relatives, not resources. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, again, that personal, uh, and Thomas ultimately in one of his, it, it, his Schumacher, I think it was 1992 or maybe 94, I think it was 92, Schumacher lecture um, uh, delivered in, in like Great Barrington uh, is one of the best encapsulations of the wisdom of his work. In that, he talked about the first condition of the Ecozoic era. We will not achieve the Ecozoic era. Humans will not survive unless we come back to that life, the earth, is a communion of subjects, mm -hmm. not a collection of objects. That personal I-thou relationship that instills humility rather than hubris. Mm -hmm. This idea of man, conqueror of nature, is the most self-destructive thought form in human history. And ultimately, I consider it idolatry from an eco-theistic -the perspective. Yes, and I wanted to just say something else about the communion of subjects along those lines, that what time is meant by that is and how we, and what that means really, even, even uh, to further develop it. So, you, so the communion of subjects needs to be understood within the larger cosmological context and the three principles that Thomas articulated that the directionality of the universe. So I wanna really clarify that. So if we're talking about the communion of subjects, not a collection of objects as earth, 
by the communion of subjects, Thomas located the communion of subjects within the larger uh, structure of the universe. So this is, uh, for example, when we were in the novitiate, uh, we asked Thomas Berry, where is the universe going? And Thomas said, the universe is moving in three directions simultaneously. And those directions are that in all times and in all places, the universe is moving toward greater differentiation. So difference is, you know, Miriam McGillis said in that early tape, difference is the truth. So the universe moves towards greater differentiation, deeper interiority, meaning every differentiated being has an interior or an isness to it. So the, the panther has an isness, the eagle has an isness, an interior or a subjectivity. Right. So that's the subject. So every differentiated subjectivity or every subjectivity has a, is differentiated and the totality is held in communion. So he called the three governing themes of the universe the footprints of God because they are present everywhere and at all times. So when we talk about the subject, the earth is a communion of subjects, what that means is that every being on the planet is differentiated, that, that the universe has to move in the direction uh, of difference. So the greater the difference, the healthier a system and the supporting of difference and the interiority of every differentiated uh, being who, who are held in communion. So of course, as we support now Black Lives Matter, we are right inside that, that, that uh, the violation of difference and the violation of the subjectivity of other is in, it's not violating any laws of ours, which I mean, fundamentally it is, but fundamentally it's a violation of the laws of the universe itself. That violation of not recognizing the difference of other, upholding it inside of the totality of the communion. And, and, uh, and in so many ways, uh, in so many ways we are experiencing as you, so clearly point out in the post-doom, all of your post-doom conversations, what we're experiencing is the disappearance of the subject at all levels, in all places, whether it's the polar ice caps or our animal companions or uh, black lives in the United States, it's the, or women even, the disappearance of the subject. And we are in direct violation of the laws of the universe. So that's why this principle is so central and understanding it within the larger comprehensive context of the universe is, is essential because it's not our man-made, uh, human-made laws. It's the laws of the universe that we're violating. That's, that's quite serious. Very serious. And, 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 Again, I find myself so grateful that you phrased it the way that you did, because it it uh, it points to one place where I lost my way, as I've shared with you uh, before privately, is that um, mm. Thomas always had a green heart. He never lost this deeply ecological grounding, and really interpreted evolution in the context of ecology. So, ecology was foreground evolution was background. It was the context, but that you, if, if you, if you reverse the order, if you interpret ecology and life in light of evolution, you can, you don't necessarily, but you can, and many do slip into anthropocentrism or human centeredness. So once you have a human centered interpretation of evolution, it's so easy to lose the ecological grounding and lose the sense that we need to live as a member of the community of life, as a member of the body of life, which is itself divine and has its own laws. And human laws that do not honor and live in accordance with life's laws, God's laws, the universe's laws, nature's laws, invariably uh, lead to uh, our, our own self-destruction and lead to problems. And it wasn't until December of 2012 that I came back to this ecological, you know, the ecology as, as primary. Well, let me ask, how has the universe story, how has Thomas Berry's work and what you've been grounded in and you didn't, you never lost the way as I did. Yeah. But how has that allowed you to um, integrate some pretty scary stuff and, uh, and process it emotionally as well as intellectually? Mm. Well, yeah. I mean, one thing is, could I just read a little, I, yes. a, a little paragraph? 
I just had this here with me because I thought if Michael asks a question in this regard, I am going to have this, this quote here. So uh, this is a quote from Thomas Ferry. He wrote, you know, his seminal paper that was, uh, it was in his book, The Dream of the Earth, but yeah. the seminal paper was called The New Story. Correct. As you know, I, I've, I have his Riverdale papers and that was really foundational and then it was republished in The Dream of the Earth. Yes. And so to answer your question, this is the quote that has helped me out. He wrote, uh, here we might observe that the basic mood of the future might well be one of confidence in the continual revelation that takes place in and through earth and universe. And then he goes on, if the dynamics of the universe from the beginning shaped the course of the heavens, lighted the sun and formed earth, and if the same dynamism brought forth the continent, seas, and atmosphere, and awakened life in the primordial self, and then brought into being the unnumbered variety of living beings, and finally brought us into being, and guided us safely through turbulent centuries, there is reason to believe that this same guiding process is precisely what has awakened in us in our present understanding of ourselves and our relation to this stupendous process. Lastly, sensitized to such guidance from the very structure and functioning of the universe, we can have confidence in the future that awaits the human venture. Yeah, not well, only do I love that quote, but I actually have that memorized. So I was saying it along oh, as you were reading it. Yes. And for quite a few years, I would conclude my evening programs by reciting that quote because it Lovely. is. Lovely. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, and and I, I hold that quote. The only thing that shifted for me is that in the last seven years, I now get that there's a possibility, a very real possibility. Well, we, we obviously will go extinct at some point, whether it's two million years from now mm. or 20 years from now, it's at some point we will go extinct, just to all mammals our size do. But I still hold that quote as profoundly true mm. and inspiring, even if we go extinct this century. Yes. Yeah. even if we go extinct. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Right. Thank you for reading that. That was so great. So, yes. Yeah. So anything else that you'd like to say about how, uh, how the epic of evolution, the universe story, the great story, the new story, how that has nurtured you and, and Bernadette and the, and the others um, in dealing with these, these challenging times? Yeah, well, another thing that's coming to me is is uh, something that Thomas Berry uh, used. It was a word, another word he he coined, which is the word incendence. So we think of transcendence, but he coined the word incendence. And by incendence, uh, he he meant he said that when our cultural coding has lost its integrity and has lost its, the wisdom to guide us forward into the future, we need to return to our genetic coding or our universe coding. And the, and the way to do that is through incendence. So he said, not the brain, but the gene, which when he refers to incendence, he, re, he refers to our collective dive back into the deeper knowings of our, what you know, we, could, we could say our, our universe coding. So that's why in one way, you know, we could say, let's look at the three governing principles or the footprints of God as coding our, that makes us up, the differentiation, interiority, and communion. But another thing he says is that at a time like this, when our cultural coding has lost its integrity and capacity to guide us forward, we, we return to the, the, deeper, the deeper knowing, which is our shamanic nature, that that. Uh, he's not talking about individual shamans, but the shamanic, shamanic nature of our own personalities, that we have the capacity to take the deep dive in and to activate capacities that may, may have gone dormant that can potentially lead us forward into, into a new future with a community of life. Yes. So yeah. wow. I, think, uh, I think that what we might be seeing here, like to put into modern language, is when, when we look at these developmental, new developmental theories like Robert Keegan or uh, Claire Graves and the spiral dynamics, any of these modern developmental articulations of where we're moving towards more integral thinking and ways of being non-separate in our world, to take the shamanic and not, not to go backwards into the the patterns of maybe or the ways of the of the uh 
this lone shaman. That's not the way. Now we're moving into the collective shamanic capacity. And I mean, I think practically uh, speaking, uh, one of the ways that I find uh, real uh, is the capacity now for us to dissolve our separation, our old notions of separation consciousness. And we have been very hardwired for separation through the centuries, in the individual and separate sense of self. When in reality, we know that, that, and the shamanic nature points to the ways of being more fluid within the community of life and within one another. We're, we're exploring in many different we, space, uh, we spaces in, in our day there's a lot of exploration into this new kind of way of being together where we can flow into and out of one another's fields and, and the community of life to, to have this like lots of breakthroughs happening as we activate the shamanic capacities for uh, fluidity, mutuality, listening, crossing over borders and boundaries like interspecies communication, the capacity to move beyond just human-centered uh, exchange into, into actual communicating with the community of life and, and seeking guidance from that community or even advice or just making the connection with other beings, whether they're plants in the house or the uh, beings that we may encounter uh, anywhere, like trees, you know, the mycelium web, that we're finding so much more that we didn't know before that, both scientifically and, and also experientially, they're both coming together. It's that repeat again of what I said in the beginning of the integration of the interior with the exterior or the head and the heart. So we're getting so much data from science about our community of life. And we're also trying to experiment together with that community by dissolving our boundary sense of self. And, and that's a beautiful way, potential way forward into the future, both with one another as humans and with the community of life. So capacities are opening there, you know, in wow. the incendence. That's what I think Thomas, some of what Thomas was meaning about incendence to seek the guidance there. Yes, exactly. Well, I like the I like the Russian nesting dolls as a visual image of both the shamanic and the incendants because you know the the nested nature of ourself that we don't exist. Uh, Michael Dow doesn't exist if the microbiome within me isn't doing what it's doing, and I don't exist without the trees that provide the oxygen and the animals and the plants that provide the food and you know and so on. So that nested sense of self. Uh, makes me less, uh, you know, uh, I don't merely identify with mm -hmm. this, you know, what Alan Watts called the, the skin encapsulated ego. Mm -hmm. um, and God, reality as a whole, also has that, uh, that sense of incendence. I love the fact that you brought that up because I interpreted it always as the beyond within or the, the voice of the past and the voice of the future now in the present. Uh so it's, it's, it's that wisdom that can be gained when we realize that the past isn't behind us, the past isn't to the left of us, that the entire past lives inside of us right now, right here. And we can access that wisdom if we have the humility to recognize that in the Western tradition, the way I think about it is once we realize, once, once we grant that whatever we mean by the word God has to include the living, pulsing voice and presence of reality in its fullness, which includes the ecosphere. So then we ask the question, if God's word includes what the sparrows are telling us, what, this, what the soil is telling us, what the earthworms are telling us, what the climate is telling us, then of course we're going to relate to the body of life as a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects, mm -hmm. simply by having a theological understanding of God being infinite rather than finite, God being unlimited and present in and through all life. So that, that's a way in the Western tradition that I've found it useful to simply by uh, untrivializing the notion of God and recognizing that God cannot possibly be less than the voice and the presence of the, of, of the, of the, the ecosphere and ultimately the cosmos, mm -hmm. and then whatever transcends that, uh, allows me to see that, that incendence, the beyond within, uh, the past and the future here now, 
Um, and then that shamanic sort of communion with that. So thank you for bringing that yes. up. Yes, yeah, as you're speaking, Michael, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, and maybe for the listener too, ways of accessing the shamanic, our shamanic capacities within the communion of life. I'm just going to give one uh, example, uh, a recommendation, because I've been doing it myself to heighten my own sensitivities to the communion of subjects by starting, uh, by starting small. So I, about a year ago, I, um, uh, let me just backtrack. When I was a little kid growing up in Brooklyn, <laughs> where there wasn't that much life, you know, form that more, more concrete, but still there was life. We had, you know, those magnifying glasses that enabled us to see, you know, and magnify like flies or bees or what, which is a great experience uh, to actually connect with, uh, real, uh, you know, the smaller mm -hmm. communion beings in the communion but more recently i've gotten a a jeweler a loop i think it's called a loop you know they're small like this and they're a magnifier okay and you go out and you could look at leaves so i had been going around our property with this you know and and it has i it has brought me into worlds beyond worlds like just yesterday i was in with i was in with the you know the forget me not flowers yeah i was in with the forget me not and i could stay there for a very very long time to see the pollen the stamen the and then the hairs on leaves and uh and um and and uh, this uh this incredible sensitivity is arising in me to the to the communion uh, of subjects and because i'm sensitizing to the small and so what is getting heightened by attending to the small is a, an awareness of the elegance of structure of each of these subjectivities. Mm -hmm. These are life breathing reflections of the divine in, in tiny form. And we could all start there, just get a magnifier and start going into the elegance of structure at the micro level. And it, it's, it's, it to me is like the modern shamanic way of making connection right with the community of life. And it opens up life, and and I feel like an establishment of a relationship with. Yeah. Wow. Well, Gail, there are other questions that I've uh, asked some of my other guests in terms of impermanence and death and things like that, uh, but I don't want this to go too long. Well, you've read the questions, so anything that you were sort of prepared to talk mm -hmm. about, if you wanted to, but just anything that you would like to say that would bring this this amazing conversation to completion. So yeah, I mean, I just maybe leave one image. Um, maybe one image that's coming up for me uh, that has to do with coherence or steadiness. And I, I like to end with that kind of, a, that image or that maybe call to uh, go forward or what we're all, what we're all needing right now. So um, one, uh, there's two images actually, but I want to show you this. This is an image, uh, this image is called the Taurus. And okay. the Taurus is a, uh, a primary cosmic pattern uh, in which energy, uh, actually energy is flowing out and back into that center, the primal center, which they call the still point. And then it flows back out again. And then in, it's like this, the, it's toroidal, toroidal energy and it's, it's a cosmic pattern. And, um, and there's something about hitting that center point and that's the point of coherence, right? The point of returning back to source. So whether that's in death or whether that's living in our, our lives right now, and then just going back into that still point, that point of coherence so that we get informed by that and the deeper into that central point, the deeper we go in that interior, then we flow out and bring it out, bring it out, and then we return back in and then we bring it out again. So I love that image of, hitting into center point, that point of stillness. It's love's coherence. And, and we keep tapping into that in order to bring it back out into the world. And I love that energetic, you know, that motion. And it is a cosmic prince pattern. I remember first encountering that in a way that was memorable for me was in Dwayne Elgin's book, I think written in the late 80s, early 90s, Awakening Earth. And he had that, that same pattern. And it's interesting, coincidentally, in terms of timing, because I just got an email from uh, Dwayne Elgin and uh, Colleen uh, yesterday uh, that they've got a new project, a new book coming out called Choosing Earth. 
And uh, mm -hmm. so um, it's serendipitous that you would show that image that reminds me of, of Duane's uh, legacy contribution. Yes, it's beautiful. I mean, maybe for the listener too, is for all of us to find that. What is that point? What is the point? How do you get, you know, how to get to that point each, probably be needed each day yes, to yes. inform ourselves. Uh, it's the deep, the deep uh, interior by whatever name, that energetic, it's an energetic uh, motion of flow that hits the center and returns back out. I, don't, I just find that really beautiful in our but, time. But, but even, even that question, I mean, I, wanna, I, I don't want us to go too, too fast beyond that because I'm feeling the, the call, the uh, invitation to be clear for myself, where is that point? that can nourish me on a day-by-day -day basis, that can nourish me in the inner way that can then support my outer work. So right. meditative movement yeah. um, that honors the, the rhythms and flows of the energy. Yes, and a very simple one is the, the Ocho or the figure eight to energetically just make this motion mm. to help balance. Mm. Just even that in a moment of panic, fear, grief, you know, whatever that is, uh, after watching the news, balance self out, you right. know, after reading some of this stuff that we're doing, because we're taking the world in uh, yeah. and we want to be able to go back out in service to that world and not get to pull down into the black hole of, of all the difficulties. So. Yeah. Wow. That's great. And uh, you yeah, said that's a very a, simple. Yeah. And you said there was a second image. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, the second image is more of a, it's a Christian image, uh, but it's, it, I'm just going to show it to you because we have it on all of our walls in our monastery. Okay. And it's, it's this image. Uh, it's called Christ in the Boat. And um, it's based on the Christian gospel story of Jesus traveling across the sea and there's a big storm and the, uh, the disciples are all like, you know, panicking and frantic and chaotic and they wake jesus up and and because the the it's it's an image of uh, uh of the christ consciousness as that which is aligned and coherent with source and and i don't know if you ever read the story of Thich Nhat han you know the buddhist vietnamese oh, yeah. monk and so from the buddhist tradition he tells a similar story of how um during the time of uh of the Vietnamese refugees, oftentimes people would be in the, in the boats and they would come into a stormy sea. And if only one person in the boat remained calm and centered like that Christ in the boat, if only one person held that coherence, it would help everyone in the boat eventually calm them all and get the boat to safety. If everyone in the boat went off, oftentimes the boats would, would drown, they'd, be, yes. they'd all die and drown. So it's just another, it's a Buddhist way into this Christian image that we hold here of, of the holding of coherence, of conscious coherence in the self, because it can help our world immensely at this time, or in situations we find ourselves when people, we may be with a COVID patient, uh, someone who's dying, or uh, innumerable uh, situations we're finding ourselves in, but it's the kind of holding that central line of con it's in consciousness you know keeping the horror straight and holding the consciousness of steadiness and it's such a simple gift that we could give our world right now just to hold the world in it too yes and the people we love right in steadiness amen i mean i remember I, I i was privileged in 1994 to spend a week with Thich Nhat Han on a retreat for peace activists because he said mm. some of the most non-peaceful people he knows are peace activists. Mm. And so he told that story about peace mm. as peace activists when we are in that centered place and coming from a place of genuine compassionate love rather than anger and, and whatever that we can impact the community of other peace activists and others who are maybe we are protesting. That's why Gandhi and Martin Luther King insisted on doing it out of compassion and love. Yeah, lovely. Mm. Wow, Gail, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michael. It's always great to talk with you and connect. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much.